All right. Good afternoon, everybody. We are going to be talking about legacy and startup brands, and we're fortunate to have a real Renaissance CMO who can definitely address this for us. Wow. Uh, wow. <laughs> Kieran has been everything from the CMO of Radio Shack. He ran marketing for Helio. He ran great advertising in San Francisco and is currently the CMO of Belkin. So I think he's well positioned to give us a broad perspective. And, uh, Karen, I thought we'd start, since we're talking about legacy and startup brands, you're right now getting to do a little bit of both in your current role. So at Belkin, he has three big flagship brands that are in different phases of a life cycle. So tell us a little bit about that and how you go about prioritizing your resources and kind of your thinking about those that brand portfolio. Sure, prioritizing resources. I think that's probably the number one um, biggest issue facing CMOs. They're always prioritizing opportunities, dollars, uh, team focus, and so forth. So for me, we've got three brands. We've got the Belkin brand, uh, which is everything around the mobile space, mobile accessories, and so forth. That's quite a commoditized space, but we have a very strong premium brand in there. If you're in Hudson News in the airport, you see a really good representation of the Belkin brand in that regard. And, but again, it is uh, somewhat commoditized, so we have a very different um, uh, challenges within that environment and how we talk about the brand. Then in networking, we also uh, own Linksys. We acquired Linksys two years ago from Cisco. So that's a brand that we're bringing back uh, within the networking space. They were the dominant preeminent brand when it comes to networking. And so we're really investing in the products and the experiences and the software to truly reflect what the power of Lynx is, uh, should be. And then our latest brand, our little baby, uh, which is actually a big baby grown up very quickly, is in the Internet of Things space, the smart home space called Wemo. And again, that's our, our point of view about the smart home. It's the most approachable, affordable entry point into the smart home environment. So again, a nascent category with a new brand, very different challenges re-establishing a dominant brand back in the networking space and continue to innovate in a space that's somewhat commoditized. Those are the challenges that I'm facing. So how have you structured your marketing organization to meet those three challenges? What makes sense to centralize and what do you push out to the business units? So we're actually in a transition over the last two years. I joined a little over two years ago. And at that point, we actually had one brand and it was acquiring a second brand. So as you think about our organization, we were built uh, through the channel. So our, our organization was structured globally through the channel, through the retail customer space. And what we've evolved over the last two years is evolving to a more centralized role within the organization, a centralized brand, a centralized portfolio that really speaks to the needs of the marketplace. So the pendulum has swung a little bit more towards the centralized versus decentralized for a number of reasons. When you think about the category in technology, it really is the one of the few categories globally that's consumed in a similar manner. So we're able to talk about the products in that way plus the ecosystem that we're part of, the devices when they launch, that's when you want to make sure you got the attach rate. So somebody else is driving some of those bigger, more macro decisions, and we just have to ensure that we attach ourselves at that point of launch to ensure our products are well represented. That's kind of the Belkin space. In networking, obviously innovation, helping people understand the importance of the router. With all these devices in the home these days, people don't realize how much it's really diluting our are impacting their ability to get a, a, a powerful experience. So again, shedding light on what you need to look for when you're buying a router, why it's important to continue to upgrade because most people don't realize they have more than you know, 13, 14 devices in the home drawing that Wi-Fi and they still have a lot of legacy technology that's five to six years old. So you're really choking yourself as it relates to getting the best experience. And then on Wemo, it's really helping people understand how they can get the most out of technology. Technology is no longer disconnecting us. It's allowed us to connect in our daily lives with people, bringing the human element back into it. So you said that you've centralized a lot of the structure, which gives you great efficiency, but you've got three very different business challenges. What are the kinds of marketing tasks that you think have to be done really at the 
kind of in a more decentralized fashion. Sure, when you, think of, when you think about it, content marketing is a big part of what we do, okay? So really establishing uh, the tenets around the content and how it really speaks to that brand, but then how it gets uh, localized in a way that's relevant at that level. So, you know, for instance, in some markets, different colors are more uh, appealing, so that's one element of localization. It's that simple, you know, to be frank, you know, one market they love pink or blue, and in other markets, you know, black or white tends to be the color palette that people go with. So that in itself is a simple way of, of helping the market understand, we know what your needs are. So you don't present a, a pink uh, power cord in, in you know, maybe the Netherlands, because they much prefer a white or a black. So just understanding those market news is very important. So within the system, we have um, digital asset management more regionally uh, focused right now. We're now going to a global digital asset management platform that will allow us to really, uh, on the fly, depending on the market, present the right uh, colors in, the, in that market. So tell us a little bit about the process that you're going through for that. How do you figure out what vendors might uh, be good to partner with? So that, that in itself is a big process, identifying the process. So we actually started this about two years ago where we identified a need for a marketing resource management tool sitting on top of dig digital asset management. But part of that is getting to a more global organization to take advantage of it. So we, we developed the structure, the organizational structure, what it would look like globally, and then those roles and responsibilities then feed into what an MRM platform looks like. So setting that is so critical because that's what your needs are when you're going out talking uh, about the different platforms that you can best use. And then the second part is understanding the type of assets that are used and getting a really good sense of the frequency, uh, the duration of those assets, and other elements, you know, one of the things that we do, obviously, with power products, they have to be certified uh, locally. That's a very important thing. So you, cannot, you should not be, or nor could you ever, be representing a product in the market if it hasn't been certified locally. How can you ensure that, again, your digital asset management's way to ensure those products are presented in that right manner? Now, in this kind of a huge project, what role do you play and what role does your um, CIO or CTO play? How do you very, very that? critical role. Uh, our, our CIO is just phenomenal, very, very fortunate. And together, she and I really you know, complete that whole entity as it relates to the marketing needs with the technology backbone. We actually are so unified, we share the same assistant for that reason. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, is, it is very, very important. And, um, uh, as it relates to the MRM uh, digital asset management uh, program, she and her team really helped us identify uh, what the needs are, develop the RFP, and then really, really help us understand the, they created this great scoring system for each platform between MRM and digital asset management. And then the question, big question was, should it be unified? Should it be individual and come together? All of that, all of that thinking really came from that team and helped us get to the right solution. I think you've probably got a lot of people in the audience who would be envious of that kind of um, seamless partnership. Any advice for marketers who don't have that kind of relationship with their CTO, how they develop it? Sure, I think it's just like anything. As a marketer, you know, I think one, one key trait of a great marketer is having this innate curiosity. I think you know, if you don't have that strong relationship or understand what the CIO and that team is about, it's just really spending time with them, learning what their challenges are, what their needs are. In some cases, and maybe they have a complete lack of resources to even touch some of the programs you need to work on. So that's that common roadmap that you develop together and then get executive buy-in across the board. So we, we have a quarterly uh, steering committee around IT and, and there we review the various roadmaps Marketing is a big part of it. We'll go up and present our, our case for uh, investment, and we, that's how we manage it. And I've heard you talk a little bit about how you personally try and stay current with meeting with agencies. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I thought it was great Yes, uh, one of the things I do, uh, we have a, a quite uh, a good internal uh, agency resource, but we always use external agencies for very strategic projects as well. One of the things I like to do is, you know, through my network and through um, just paying attention to the marketplace, spend time with those agencies in different cities, learn about who they are and what they do. And I think by doing that, you really get a sense of what's happening. 
It's nearly like the equivalent if you're a retailer just going on store visits. I do those all the time. But as part of a store visit, you should go and do a resource visit, right? And maybe some of you might not use today, but could be tomorrow, could be down the road. The other big part of it is, is really talking about our brands in that environment. It, it's another way of, of connecting with talent. And you know, talent you know, begets talent. And I think that's a great way to highlight what we're doing and talk about our brands. And people find us in that regard as well. So it's, it's this kind of mutual uh, admiration society where you respect what they're doing. Hopefully, they respect what you're doing. And collectively, there's something good come out of down the road. You know, when you come to one of these kinds of days, I think you always want to take one thing home that makes you do your business different. And this was the one that I'm taking away from a lunch we had. Uh, both Kiran as well as John from Moet said that when they're out doing their business travel, they proactively go out and meet with agencies, even when they're not in the middle of a, a pitch or um, looking for a specific capability, because they just see that as a way to stay in the, the flow of uh, good ideas, good people, good talent out yeah, there. Yeah, and you really understand who's really doing the work. And the other part is also understanding competitive environment, who they are, uh, sees their competitive set. And you can find out about other agencies there as well. So I just think it's how you keep abreast of what's going on. I think you also take a real personal interest in customer care. And um, Belkin is an organization where customer care actually reports up through the CMO, through, uh, through Kiron. So can you talk a little bit about how you manage the customer care organization, maybe a little bit of the technology that you're using there? Sure. We're um, actually quite a large Salesforce implementation. Um, over 20 million accounts in our Salesforce database. And that's really one, uh, that's the, the single voice of truth about our customers and our products. So if someone comes into the system, we can track everything that they've talked about in the past, see if it's a recurring problem, if it's a new problem. One of the things I'm very proud about in, the, in this past year, uh, particularly on Twitter, we have migrated a lot of the, 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 the media connection uh, through our Belkin Cares, our uh, Linksys Cares, and our Wemo Cares handle, where we move them off the main feed into a separate feed. And there immediately, the first thing we do is we recognize and acknowledge their, their comment. Secondly, then we help understand what it is and get them into the system and work them offline in a way that, that addresses the question as quickly as possible. As you can imagine, in Linksys and networking, that's a real pain point if your network is down. A lot of times, it's not even us, by the way. You know, it could be an ISP issue and so forth. But we could be just that, that brunt of people's frustration at that point in time. You know, being empathetic, recognizing, saying, OK, let's go through some of these steps, and we'll get you back up very quickly. And sometimes we, could, we, we learn that they may have a router that's 8, 10 years old. We say, you know what, this is a time possibly you may want to upgrade. Do you realize how many devices you have on it? So is that empathetic part in helping them understand what else is really putting strain on their system. And you yourself spend a lot of time listening and engaging, right? So talk yeah. a little bit about that, and then also how you set that expectation for your team. I, I think it's phenomenal. I just being on social media and hearing directly from your customers, whether it's good, bad, is it, just so, so important. And being able to ha have that access. And so for me and our team, we, we spend a lot of time um, we've got some great ideas in our communities. Uh, we use Lithium to create uh, some of our community platforms. Two products in the Wemo family came out of our community uh, sitting on Lithium a lot in this past year. One was a light switch, and the second one was this Wemo maker for the DIY market. So many of the people who were on there were just really talking about, wouldn't it be great to have this and this? And that's what we created very quickly for them. So that's a great way of the feedback, timely feedback in creating products. And you've also done some things to kind of create a lab and experiences right there in your headquarters. Yes, right? we do. We have a, a completely vertically integrated design all the way through and within our organization. So for instance, uh, we do a lot of uh, quantitative work, but we also do a lot of qualitative work. We have our own uh, focus group facility on site that we're constantly doing research in whether it's for UX, whether it's for marketing needs, whether it's for product design. And the beauty of it is, as we receive feedback, uh, we can iterate overnight. We got 3D, obviously 3D printing and a model studio. We're able to revise products the next day, go back in straight away, and continue to iterate uh, on that feedback. So as an agile marketing organization, 
you also need agile research to be able to fully power an agile marketing organization, and that's a key part of what we do. And how do you find agile marketers? What do you look for in the talent on your team? Wow. You know, that's, that's, that's one that's, that's um, someone who has the ability to be able to see the strategy and the execution uh, on a very quick basis. Uh, what we find is, you know, people are very much focused on the tactical part and forget where the strategy, both the marketing strategy and the business strategy is going. Because sometimes it can start to diverge. You want to make sure that the business strategy is obviously driving the marketing strategy. So uh, we actually in, uh, make sure that everyone who's on that team has the ability to sit into those focus groups and learn from it. Uh, we, we do a lot of uh, research across the board, whether it's UX, as I said, they're totally involved. So every customer touch point goes through the marketing team, and they have to know what's happening in-store, online, with the product, within the CA organization. Those things are very, very important. So I think an agile marketer is someone who has the ability to take advantage of opportunities, keep the path, keep, the, uh, keep on the right path where you're ultimately going to go, and be able to make changes uh, when necessary. I think you know this 100% completion rate of everything is probably uh, no longer achievable. I think if you can get to 75, 80%, then keep going. Mm -hmm. um, I know you have been very focused on making uh, WeMo into a movement, and part of that has been finding the right agency partner. Right. And you've got a kind of an interesting background for that because you've run an agency. Talk a little bit about how you selected your agency partner for WeMo and how you went about structuring that relationship. So it was, um, we, again, we had a great opportunity with WeMo becoming a standalone brand. Initially started as a product. It was a, in a switch in, under Belkin brand. And the switch was just a smart plug you plug into a wall, use an app to par. And uh, last year, we decided to pull Wemo out as a standalone brand because it was a different target than the Belkin target. Belkin target was a subset of Wemo, but it's a much broader target. And what we felt is we were developing a strategy. I felt it was important to have an agency come along in that journey with us because A, it's a brand new category with a new brand. And there's so many questions that will come out of that. And to sp spool up an agency after all the strategy work was initially done and not be included in that, I think was a big miss. So I had um, an hour feel of seven agencies. I gave, the, I gave them a very specific brief, in, and that was only one thing. Help us identify the journey we would go on together as we create the strategy and the subsequent uh, work to support that strategy. Everything else I left open. I gave them uh, two weeks to come back in. Each agency had two hours. In the two weeks I cleared my calendar, I told them, each agency, you have as much of my time as you need. And uh, obviously, certain agencies use a lot more than others. But interestingly enough, the agency that won used the least amount of my time and used the least amount of the two hours in, in the pitch. They were in and out in 75 minutes. And that's because they were so focused. They had a, a culture of focus around the strategy development to the execution that was so succinct that they led the meeting in a way that was very clear why they should win that business. And how did you go about uh, negotiating the contract with them? After you, you found the agency, you knew that uh, they were the ones, but you wanted to make sure you got the kind of right. the best deal out of it. Sure, and I mean, you look at the, you, you look at the workload. Most agencies, and look at the workload, the FTEs multiplied by the hours. So you get a sense of, uh, from a total standpoint, how many hours an agency would need to work over a period of time. So, so as as an ex agency CEO, I, I had a sense of. Roughly ballpark would make sense if it was right in the ballpark. But for me, the way I look at it is I try not to negotiate too much in cost. If it's within that realm, it really is, you know, the agency put a lot of time and effort into it. I like to uh, give them the benefit of me respecting their time and a fair value on that. And if I started to negotiate heavily, it just became very much about it's just another product or another commodity. And I think each agency has, has its own unique skill set. So I think I'd encourage you all, try not to negotiate too much around the pure raw fees. Just make sure the deliverables are the one that you all agree upon. And at the end of the day, give yourself flexibility within the contract. If for some reason you need to make some changes, take advantage of other opportunities. But really, nickel and diming, I think, is, is not a way to, to treat an agency. 
music to a lot of agency years. Uh, one last question. You have been named one of the most influential CMOs on Twitter. So any advice for folks in the crowd who might want to like, up their influence profile? Sure. I, well, I'll try. I don't know if I have advice. <laughs> um, I just think, you know, it's just really the engagement, just caring. I think what people have to say and learn from them and, you know, uh, pay it forward, I think is a big part of it. I think just being authentic. Obviously, technology is near and dear to my heart, so I talk about technology. I also do a lot with, um, with the Irish government around helping startups, so I do a lot of promotion around that. Uh, personal things I love, I love rugby and I love aviation. So those are kind of the four areas I really uh, talk about. So if you're on Instagram or Twitter, you'll see that's kind of what I talk about. Great. Well, thank you all. And thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy.